Hello, hello. Welcome to the Herbal Book Club. Um, this is part 33 of our journey through a wise remedy. <laughs> um, we are broadcasting live from the Seawool Herbs and Tarot YouTube channel as well as the Herbal Book Club Facebook group. And the plant we're going to do is clematis, which is a plant that I don't even think I've ever, I've never worked with before. Um, this chapter is called, that we are um, going to be reading, which is a really fun, fun chapter. I'm typing it. <laughs> but, uh, so, mending with the devil's darning needles. Um, the tangled lannis of wild clematis, and apparently clematis is like a vine. Um, I've got a Wikipedia. Um, it is an aggressive growing vine, so that's cool. It's got like little white, it's got white flowers. Um, I don't, I've never seen it in, um, that I know of in, in real life. So, um, I'm sure it's been around me. Um, and, um, so anyway. <laughs> um, but it's never been like, I've never had it pointed out. I've never even noticed on my own and be like, Hey, what's that plant? So it's just something that, um, uh, is going to, is a new plant for me pretty much. I mean, so this is clematis is the plant. Hello. How are you doing out there in Facebook land? Will you pop your name in the chat? Um, because unfortunately on StreamYard Facebook, it just says Facebook user. So, but hello, or you don't have to if you don't want to. <laughs> um, so welcome. Uh, obviously we're, we're doing Clematis. So um, if anyone out there has worked with Clematis or use Clematis, um, you know, and um, what, what do you use it for? Um, Tell some of your experiences with it. Um, yeah, so it's got some Latin names. Um, the one, the Wikipedia. Hey, Christy. Hi, welcome. I'm good. Yeah. Um, the um, the Wikipedia. Botanical name, the Latin name is uh, Clematis virginia annis, but there's a few that she's mentioned. Um, so, but um, yeah, I'll just type that one in and then everyone can go from there because there's a bunch. And um, so, let's see, let's see. Get the technical stuff over with first, right? Oh, I think I spelled that right. Oh my gosh. E I R G I N I A N A. So it's, um, we've got that one, and then, oh, this is supposed to be capital C, sorry. I think this one might be from Mexico. Um, obviously, one sounds like it's from Virginia because you can tell it's usually got, so it's a Nero Mexicana. Um, you can tell sort of where a plant is originated by its Latin name, which is really cool. Um, so, and this one looks like it's uh, um, 
it's an uh, C. I, I lied. I'm gonna put all of them. This one is probably from China. So, um, and then she says other related species. So she lists three species here. We're on page 154. If anyone has the book and wants to follow along, um, and the common names, which are a lot more fun, and well, I mean, Latin names are fun too, but um, the common names are virgins. Bower, Traveler's Joy, Love Vine, Ladies Bower, Sugar Bowls, <laughs> Devil's Darning Needles, Pepper Vine, Leather Flower, and um, Base Vine. And then one I can't pronounce, looks like it's in um, a possibly different uh, language or uh, Gribbon. Oh uh, yeah, I know. I'm gonna mess that up. Um, so let's see. I know the difference, but the different varieties really vary in size. I've had once when I lived in Ohio, I had tiny white and yellow flowers, and was shocked at the t tiny how tiny the flowers were but many have really big flowers. Oh, okay. So sometimes with these varieties, they are very similar. And sometimes they're very different. Um, so, but a lot of times, um, especially if she's listing this in the book, they'll have similar medicinal properties. Now, like take echinacea for an example, um, Echinacea angustifolia and Echinacea propitia, they have similar qualities, but they're different. So you would actually use them differently. Um, so this is something to like notice and like just be aware of. That's cool. Um, the one that I was looking at in Facebook, I mean, not in Facebook, in um, on the Wikipedia article, how it looked like it had smaller flowers. So, um, cool. Awesome. Um, now I have to go find him here. <laughs> um, all right. So, oh yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna type, um, some of those awesome, these are really great, really great common names. Um, and a lot of times with the common names, you, you know, there's clues to how and what the plant, uh, you know, can be used for. Ladies, probably should have typed this before. I was. Sugar bowls. And this is the one I cannot pronounce. But I'm going to write it down anyway because I think that is good. So these are all. Hopefully it's about everything right. All the common names. Um, there's probably more. <laughs> um, so, um, oh, oh, the you have the uh, echinacea. Yes, the cone flowers. Yes, they're they're beautiful. Um, a lot of people use them uh, just for ornamental, um, but you know um, they are medicinal, and I and I love that. Um, they're everywhere in, in my neighborhood and um, I'll probably like plant them when I like when I move um, eventually so um, yeah um, so the energetics the fresh plant is classified as hot the taste is acrid and bitter 
Um, the parts used are leaf, flower, vine, root bark, and root bark, which is always interesting. Um, so primary actions, vascular tonic, vasculodilator, um, which helps with the vascular system, um, relax and nerve vein, so it's uh, good for you, good, good to relax your brain, your nervous system, um, antispasmodic, so if you've got like spasms anywhere, it helps calm those, uh, anti-inflammatory, everyone probably knows what that one means, um, so seems awesome, um, so the specific indications are, are like when you would use this plant, uh, arthritis, worsened by cold, damp conditions or, or weather, migraines from vascular, Antony, Antony? anxiety, fear, and weepiness with concurrent feelings of ungroundedness and a sense of disconnection from reality. Dude, I could have used this plant this week. You know, we are trying to buy a house and it was a heck week. So um, I really could have used it. <laughs> um, hence, we are like taking it down. Oh, hello out there. Thank you for joining us. Um, they have a very woody bark. I don't even know. Didn't even know Clonus was medicinal. Yes, I. I would double check. Um, I would be careful. Hey, Heather. Um, I would uh, make sure that you are able to properly identify like what, you know, that you of course have clematis and that you know maybe what variety it is. Um, but I mean, I think you know you already have it, but just double check. Um, and then, you know, uh, and then, uh, um, so that's cool. It's always nice to know that a plant is medicinal that you didn't know. Um, how are you doing, Heather? <laughs> Heather, do you have clematis on your land? Um, okay, so page 54. I know, I... I can't see anything. Ha ha. Um, the sprawling, tangly lannis of wild clematis climbing Jupiter, juniper, oak, and even alder trees are a familiar and sweet sight here in the gala. That's her. That's where um this. What? Oh, I'm good. Whoa, a house. Yeah, no, not yet. Um, it's kind of a hot mess, so uh, you know, we um, we're gonna slow it down. Um, you know, take a breath. The market here is crazy, and there was other things going on. So um, yeah, but yeah, we would like to get a house one day. That would be really cool. Um, as you can see, we are quite smushed in this apartment, um, but. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, um, their vibrant light green foliage winds its way up tree and stone. Its winding, long winding roots can manage to grow a tight grip into even narrow rock crevices and hard, dry soil. With ivy to bright white flowers, they stand out against the blue-green shade of the oak woodlands and their feather tailed seeds are a distinctive mark of this prolific and abundant vine in the mountains southwest and beyond. Sometimes given innocent and romantic set sounding names such as Virgin's Bower or the Lady's Vine, Clematis has also been known as Devil's Darning Needles. <laughs> Clematis was at one time a very large genus containing about 300 species but has been recently broken down into several smaller subgena but clematis itself is rel relate it but clematis itself is retained and the species most typically of it botanically are still included under the name i've listed some of the species above 
I know to be medicinally active. But to my understanding and experience, any species that demonstrates a significant acrid, as in, in it burns the shit out of your mouth, <laughs> taste will work just fine. Fantastic. Uh, Heather says, I have autumn clematis and virgin, virgin's bower, whether I want them or not. <laughs> they recede rampantly. Yeah, that's what it sounds like here. Well, you can use them medicinally, Heather, so that is the plus. Um, and the more she goes into the description, the more I believe I have seen. In fact, I have seen them, and they, you know what? This plant grows on my road. So it's like, like I was saying, I was like, I'm pretty sure I've seen it. Um, but totally, like, there's a house, and it just, it, it, the, it grows up one of their trellises and down, and, and they cut it back, like, last year. But it's, you know, it just, yeah. That's cool. Um, I think the flowers smell really good. Um, so, um, good point. I didn't know that either. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, this, this summer I'll have to, um, I'll have to take some pictures of it and, uh, you know, see if I can, like, I do some identifications. Um, so, let's see. I have no idea if this extends to any of the hybrid, hybridized or domesticated cultivars, as I've worked exclusively with wild clematis at this point. So, the one I have growing in, in a, you know, neighbor's uh, yard, of course, maybe I'm not be medicinal, but I'm not going to be like picking it for medicinal value. You know, I'm just going to be sort of looking at it. Um, so, um, strongly active clematis will be acrid and burn your mouth quite noticeably. Young leaves are by far the best, and I try to harvest it when the leaves are not quite grown and at least a month before flowering. Not to say it wouldn't work later, but it would be stronger and more relaxant, both nerving and a spasmodic effect if it is harvested while still very acrid. So this, um, don't currently know where my book is. Dang it. Oh, it's okay, Heather. <laughs> oh, you'll find it. Um, so apparently this plant doesn't taste very good. Um, and a you would probably have to put it in like a formula with like better tasting herbs. So, um, and this is a very short chapter, so we'll really probably finish it today for sure. Um, we are almost done with this book, guys. I'm I'm pretty stoked. Um, on a side note, if you guys, I'm gonna start calling for us to pick another book. Um, now, just keep in mind that, like, we go through a book a year. I mean, this is a very slow book club. So, um, it's, you know, I guess if we book a book that we decided at the end we didn't, you know, at some point and we didn't like, we could switch it. But, um, you know, I just um, start thinking and know that we will be with this book for a while. So, um, uh probably do like a drawing or something or we'll take a poll to see you know who would like what book out of the suggestions so that's just I'll you know I'll be blabbering about that for a while um and it took us a while to pick a this book so um you know and it's a good one it's a real good one um So strongly active clematis will, will be acrid and burn your mouth quite noticeably. Young leaves, wait, I read that. Ha ha. Okay. In Western herbal practices, the aerial parts of leaf and stem are the most often used. While in Chinese medicine, the root bark is often utilized as well. Have you ever tasted the spicy bite of clematis leaves? You still haven't tasted anything until you've taken a nibble of the root bark. This uh, indoctious looking root is acid enough to make your eyes water and burn 
when you chop the root bark and certainly more than strong enough to make most of us spit the offending piece of burning matter right out of our mouths. This is fairly typical of many members of the, and I cannot pronounce this word, um, so I will type it because I think this is the family. This is the family of uh, this planet's from. Ran you you in let's see run you run it so this is the family A U N U N Yep and it and the family I learned has to do with the flowers. <laughs> Woohoo! So, um, but anyway, that's the family. <laughs> They're so yum. Yeah, I know, right? It just really does paste a, paint a picture. You're like, I can just taste it now. I literally can just taste that. <laughs> oh my gosh. So. Um, so the, the family, which certainly tends towards the acritates in general, which is why so many of them make excellent antispasmodics, a quality directly associated with acritates by many systems of traditional medicine. So that's cool. Um, yeah. Um, all right, the Lady's Bower, a peaceful refuge. We're on page 56. Um, so this herb is most indicated for those who are experiencing cold signs with or without symptoms of dampness as well. These individuals will likely have a pale tongue and middling to slow pulse, pale skin, an overall sense of tiredness, and an aversion to cold weather. These people are often easily upset or disoriented and may be referred to as spacey. They often have difficulty remaining ungrounded, especially when feeling strongly emotional. Closely related to um, anemone? I don't know what this one is. This is another plant here. Now, the thing about this book is she always used words, big words. And I'm pretty good at words, but. Okay, so this, I guess, is the plant that our Clematis is related to. Um, does indeed have overlap in action and effects with the famed. Pusticula? Oh, my gosh. I'm trying, guys. Yeah, did I spell it wrong? Yep. <laughs> so sometimes what happens in herb books is they need a little more description for me. So anyway, um, this is not unsubscribing since they share some important constituents. I first learned of this southwestern from southwestern herbalist Mimi Camp that clematis can act as a nervine in similar ways to this one here. Um, and it's certainly not exactly the same medicine, but close enough to be very useful. So, you know, herbalism is cool because you can switch it around. I mean, I mean you can um, use plants for more than one thing. And sometimes if you don't have one plant, you can substitute for another plant that has a similar action. So I think that's what she's talking about. I kind of wish she had been a little descriptive um all right love vine uterine and ovarian pain so like this this plant here <laughs> um clematis has a marked affinity for the reproductive system especially like it whenever there is a tendency to spasmodic your uterine or ovarian pain of a cold nature typically by dull but insistent aching and often accompanied by sore sadness despondency and joint pain. 
This is from the King from the King's American Dispensary, which is a old, old book. This is a quote. Clematis Virginiana has been highly spoken of as a nerving to to urine uterine distress. Clematis recta being particularly useful in nervous insomnia, neuro neurologic and rheumatic headache, toothache, reflex neurosis of women of from ovarian or urinary irritation, neurosis of men with pain in testes and bladder, cystitis, uritis, um, and swelling of the inguinal glands. Oh my. Those hard books. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, another detour. Look at this book I got, guys. Oh, this is for a project. Um, it's a simple book, and hopefully, um, will be something on this YouTube channel. So. Anyway, I just wanted to show this off because I'm excited about this book. Um, okay, back to the back to the book. Back to the other book. Um, all right, we're on page 157. Nice. Yes, I know, right? I have some other symbol books. Um, this one. Um, and then I've got another Barbara Walker book too, which it's even bigger and. Um, so, and then, but I, I wanted some extra references, um, and I, okay, that's what I mean, blah. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, face fine, arthritic, arthritis, and aches. Clematis of the history in traditional medicine in the treatment of cold, sometimes damp, arthritis, muscle spasms, including leg cramps, and similar afflictions. I, I find it most effective when formulated with other appropriate herbs, which may indicate black cohosh, ginger, or turmeric. Well, so I know that ginger and turmeric are very warming, so, um, and then they're good, they would be good for that. And I've often found it to have some specific significant use in the treatment of joint pain in fibromyalgia, especially when combined with ashwagandha. So that's really awesome. Um, and it's just, I think I need some books on symbols. Jeez. Yeah, this one was like 30 bucks. Um, and I have a whole list of, of books that I got from, I got suggestions from people. Um, so I, I can send you Heather a whole a whole list of uh, these these symbol books, but this one I thought was great. Um, there's a few others, but um, I was like, "Give me the big one," and I and I saw a good review on it. So, um, uh, anyway, because I like I like symbols and stuff. So, sugar bowl migraines and cluster headaches so um i mean these are all like people struggle with fibromyalgia people, people struggle with migraines um so despite its wide range of actions this plant is most commonly used for migraines okay clematis is indicated as an excellent and effective vascular restrictor vascular tonic and anti-inflammatory that can be extremely helpful for those experiencing migraines related to vascular Antony, Antony, especially when other typical treatments have failed to have an effect. I've learned from Michael Moore that clematis is, so here's a quote by Michael Moore, or who is Michael Moore? Um, a useful treatment for headaches in general and migraine and cluster headaches specifically. Most effective in classic migraines when there are head flashes or visual disturbances in advance of headache, of actual headache, and most effective when, when drunk at the first sign of these pre-symptoms. Some folks find the tea works better, some find the tincture more effective, try both. So I have that, I have occasional migraines and I get the stuff 
the little, they call it an aura, but it's this little dot, little things in front of your eyes and you can sort of barely see out of one of your eyes for a while. And then, and then I got the headache over the other eye. So that's what happens to me. Um, I'm really fortunate that I don't get them a lot and usually I can function through them. They're not great if I catch it early enough and lay down and just sort of chill out. Sometimes I can event, um, avoid getting them in the first place, but you know. Um, so I really, really feel like it would be great to make a tincture from this plant right now and just keep on hand, you know, for like when that happens. I'll probably have to bring it to work. <laughs> uh, Heather says, I get sinus headaches around my eyes. I wonder if it'll work with sinuses, probably, right? It doesn't say specifically but it wouldn't be a bad idea to try. I mean, it could not work. That would, I guess, be the only thing. So, I mean, since you have a, have this plant on your land, you know, this, when it, you know, the spring before it starts flowering, I actually don't know when it flowers. Um, so we'd have to look that up, but um, that would be it. Yeah, maybe she'll, she'll tell us at the end here. Um, um, which I'm almost done. <laughs> We're probably going to wind, wind, wander into the next chapter. Um, we only have two more. All right, we've got three more chapters left, and that's it. So um, I've mostly worked with a fresh plant tincture, but the tea is indicated effective as well, and I usually keep a bit on hand to try for folks not responding to the alcoholic extract. Well, I find a fresh plant tincture made with very acrid leaves and root bark and high proof alcohol to be the strongest and most active preparation. I've also seen a five-year-old tincture made with brandy and wilted flowers and leaves that had little acrid taste to be effective in the treatment of migraines and arthritis when used in somewhat larger than usual amount of doses. So, um, oh, late summer. So flowers in the fall, Late summer. Okay, so late summer you would do the um, leaves and the air arrow parts with leaves and stems, and I guess if you could do the root bark too, if you got adventurous. <laughs> I've never harvested anything um, with root bark, so you know. But yeah, uh, considerations and counterindications. So why? So it's last thoughts and then like why maybe you should not use this plant. Not generally it, appropriate herb for those with heat signs. Caution should be used when using an over a long period of time. So short period of time, especially as a simple and not for people with dominant deficiency in anything more than acute situations. I tend to think it's best as a short term approach or buffered by an all well thought out formula. Nevertheless, I find reports of the plant toxicity to be somewhat overstated as far as it's use used appropriately and with the due respect for its strength. Strongly acid species can be moderate, mo moderated by always using the dried plant and by briefly frying in a hot pan, especially the root bark. Hmm. Dosage, five to 60 drops of flesh Fresh plant tincture, depending on the intensity of the plant and the constitution of the individual. Otherwise, a teaspoon of dried plant in one cup of just boiled water. So it's a very low dose. Um, I would definitely hazard on the five drops and just, you know, see if that could help if anyone is trying it. Um, and uh, yeah. It sounds like a cool, strong plant. All right, so that is Clematis. Um, and let's see, where is he? So, Wikipedia. Yeah, I'll just share this again. So this is the Wikipedia. Um, Wikipedia. Ooh, I just noticed a new, um, no, 
sorry. There was a new icon up for a minute. Now it's gone. Okay. Um, okay. So um, this is a real short, short, short book club. Um, on the 26th. Um, we will start on page 159, The Witch at the Edge of the Woods, Introversion and Otherness in the Hedgewise. So um, we're going to be stepping away from the plants um, and then talking about some other stuff, um, which sounds real cool. Then we've got the Bog Witch, Red Root, dressed in crimson and winter's green. So we're going to talk about Red Root and... Deep cold, earth deep in the cold mountains, so winter's wild roots, trees, and remedies, which is good because we'll be in winter um, still. And then the spiral of the twilling, twining green, my journey back to enchantment. So that's it. That's what we have left of the book. Um, so, I mean, we might be in winter. It just takes us how long to do it. <laughs> Um, since we had to go to every, two, you know, twice a week, twice a month due to my crazy work schedule. And, um, okay, cool. So we'll pick up, uh, with which of the, which of the edge of the woods on 158. Um, and be thinking about, um, books, more books. Um, I just, while we're, we just have time, I would want to recommend this book here. It just came out by Byron Ballard. Woohoo! Um, she is local to Asheville, where I live, and it's pretty awesome. So um, I got it signed. I got a signed copy from our local Malaprops bookstore here. Um, I got it signed. So. Which is awesome. It says, "May you, may your roots grow strong and deep." Um, so yeah, she has other books which are great, which are great. Um, I this one has an audio version, which I'm listening to at work, um, but the other ones don't. And um, but yes, woo. Um, All right, so um, sorry it's been it's so short this week, but um, next week will be I mean not next week next time will be much longer because I'm sure we'll have more to chat about um, with the other chapter, um, but um, we all learned I mean I learned about a new plant today so um, all right so I guess I hope everyone has a good uh, week or t you know two weeks until I see you again. Thank you for joining me. Um, and I'm going to do a shameless plug for, uh, we have a, yes, February 26th is the next time. Thank you, Heather, at 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, and I'm just gonna do a shameless plug for my other channel, which is the Stories from the Earth YouTube channel, which I started because of my Stories from the Earth interviews. Um, so um, please check that out. I'm going to um, pop a link in. <laughs> I don't have all of the um, oh, well, that doesn't help you. But anyway, it's the stories from the Earth YouTube channel. I don't have all of the the interviews. Basically, the herbal interviews will be on both channels, this one and that one. But all the other stuff will be on just that one. So um, if you love the interviews, please um, please check out that channel. Um, you have to use the link. YouTube is oh, thank. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. You have to use the link because, like, YouTube is really silly and it doesn't. I only have six subscribers, so even if I put in stories from the Earth, I couldn't find it. So, 
Um, but yeah, I think I I'll put the link in the description. I think. Anyway, I'm rambling now. So, um, <laughs> I hope everyone has a good good time. Good good. good yes, I'll see you on the 26th. Okay. Bye. <laughs>